Welcome. I would like to introduce Yashima Bet Milner, founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. Good morning, everybody. You guys had a great time yesterday? Who made it to the Google social? Yes. I want to give a special thank you to Bella Roseman for bringing the food together. We had lobster rolls and chicken and waffles, so something for everybody. Um, also, a special thank you to my good friend Jonathan Likes and BYP 100. Yes, it was, it was very cathartic to like have a protest in the Google headquarters. So that was amazing. Jonathan told me he was gonna do acoustic, like guitar, and I, didn't, I, I wasn't prepared, but I was so excited for what he did. Wonderful. I wanna welcome you all this morning. We have a very, very, very special opening panel. Um, you know, part of my job throughout the year is to think of the panel topics, what are the conversations. I get to travel all over the country talking to folks and seeing what's on the top of people's minds. And I realized that, you know, because of the fact that black people, you know, just like with any injustice, just like with American public policy, we, we really, really, really feel the brunt of um, policy change, of systemic injustice. and. In particular, with the new, new changes that are happening around big data, right? So before, I think the rest of the world and the rest of the country even felt, you know, the impact of FICO credit scores, risk assessments, and all those other things, our folks had already been dealing with it and finding ways of resisting and reimagining. Um, so the idea for this panel really came from a quote from um, Grace Lee Boggs from Detroit. Yes, come on, Detroit. She was a Chinese American black power activist. And um, she, I'm gonna read a quote from her because I don't even wanna butt her words, but I actually got a chance in the summer of um, 2015 to speak on a panel with her at the Highlander Research and Education Center. Yes, I was so nervous, even more nervous than I am now. But um, I, was, I, I was invited there to talk about an action that we'd done in Miami. That was the summer that um, Trayvon Martin's murderer was acquitted. And we decided that, you know, unless we go to the state capitol with the leadership of the awesome Dream Defenders, um, you know, it was legal precedent for, to kill black children, right? Like, that's what it was. So, you know, I got a chance to go to Highlander and talk about that experience and um, sat right next to Grace Lee Boggs. Um, but I'll read a quote from her because I think this really embodies what we're trying to do today with this panel and I think what we're also trying to do with this conference. People are aware that they cannot continue in the same old way, but are mobilized because they cannot imagine an alternative. We need a vision that recognizes that we are at one of the great turning points in human history when the survival of our planet and the restoration of humanity require a great sea change in ecological, economic, political, and spiritual values. Yes. So of course, we're, we're talking about we're the leaders that we've been looking for, right? And oftentimes, just from the history of the civil rights movement, history of social change in this country, black women have been on the forefront of that change. But before I bring on our amazing panelists, I wanted to take some time to kind of talk about what we've been up to at Data for Black Lives. So we launched the conference and launched the organization in 2017 with the conference. And since then, you know, we were in this moment where we were like, wow, like we're getting so much, so much attention. So many people are, are, are finding themselves and seeing themselves in our vision. Um, what do we do, right? How do we take a step back and really build the infrastructure of this organization to be a container to actually hold a movement, right? So the way that we've been able to conceptualize our work and really oper operationalize our work has been in three main areas, advocacy, movement building or network building, and research and innovation. So in terms of advocacy, <laughs> one of the main things that I was really focused on this year, and I'll tell you the real story, um, was this open letter to Facebook. So actually, you know, people had told me, yes, she, you know, Data for Black Lives, you guys should apply to this Facebook community leaders program, whatever it was called. And you know, my co-founders, Lucas and Max, like, okay, yes, yeah, she will, here's the application, fill it out. And I was really hesitating on writing the application. I started writing it, and as I was writing it, I realized the stuff that I'm putting in this application, everybody needs to read. 
And that's honestly where the idea for the open letter to Facebook came from. I said, this is, it, it, it was based on conversations that happened right in this space in 2017, conversations I was having with folks in the Data for Black Lives movement, but also, you know, something within me was like, we, we, this needs to be a public conversation. And it was really based on this idea that, you know, everybody, who knows what happened with Cambridge Analytica and, right, okay, so, yeah. So we are, I don't even have to get into that. So, it was really this demand of, Facebook is, has the responsibility of holding the data of 2.1 billion people 2.1 billion users that have made this platform profitable, influential, politically, socially, economically. At the same time, the conversation around Cambridge Analytica was so limited to what I call this like harm reduction stance of, you know, let's focus on, you know, making sure that this doesn't happen. Let's focus on, you know, very, very, very limited, right? And our thing was, because of Facebook's influence, because of its you know, role, obviously not just in, in influencing elections, but in our everyday life, what are the kind of demands that we need to be putting on these platforms, right? What are the kind of demands that we need to be, to be making to multinational, global tech companies in this moment, right? What are the ways in which these companies need to not just, you know, yes, privacy, absolutely, all these things are really important, but how do we make sure that they're not just, you know, harming and, you know, the human and human rights and civil rights of the folks who actually make their platforms profitable and valuable? And really, you know, I remember when I was starting Data for Black Lives, I would actually always go on research.facebook.com because if you go on there, you see that the researchers at Facebook were able to really use the data that had been collected on the platform to actually ask amazing, amazing questions around housing, around environmental justice. I mean, the, uh, the possibilities that I saw, I was jealous, like the possibilities that I saw for research, for the kind of questions that we could answer for the black community, especially, you know, we're, we're only limited to the folks who worked at Facebook who were internal to Facebook. And at the same time, when all this stuff happened, I saw what the other purposes that they were using this data, this data for. So we made three demands in this open letter, and I encourage you all to read it. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because I don't really have that much time left. But um, the first demand was to hire black researchers and black data scientists, right? So before we talk about you know, changing policies and all this other stuff, we needed to change. We need to work to change internally what's happening at Facebook. The second demand was to give black researchers and activists access to the data. So this demand was for a public data trust. Um, and this is something that we're still working on as we're involved in a civil rights audit, but also as we're thinking about what the infrastructure is for a public data trust with some of our partners. But, you know, and the third one was for a data code of ethics, right? When everything was happening around Facebook, it really, really reminded me of um, Tuskegee experiment it reminded me of so many examples in history where, you know, experiments were being, whether, you know, medical or whatever, were being used and tested on black communities, right? And as we can see more information rolling out about what happened with Facebook, that became even, even more evident, right? So how do we make sure that internally institutions like Facebook, there's an actual review process that's not just decided by folks who work there, but that's actually transparent and accountable to all of us, especially the people who use the platform every day, right? Institutions like MIT have to go through an IRB process. Researchers have to go through an IRB process in order to do research, right? Those same exact standards, and even more so, need to be enforced in institutions like Facebook. So a lot actually came out of this letter. It was more than just us campaigning against Facebook. It was really about how do we use this letter, how do we use these demands as an organizing tool, not just you know, within tech companies, but also here in our network and in our movement, but also on Capitol Hill. So in my 10 years of activism, I probably spent more time on the Hill last year than I had ever done in my, ever, right? And this is a picture of us with our Senator Ed Markey 
um, him listening, he really was listening in this meeting, and we were able to take this letter and really, really, really start a conversation, right, in this administration about the, the uses and the abuses of data, right, the ways in which data has been and will continue to be weaponized against black communities and all communities if we don't do something. And we were able to get so much response. Part of it was also um, we started to build a relationship with folks at Cory Booker's office, and he actually went on and you know supported the letter um, and um, sent a letter of his own based on our demands to Mark Zuckerberg and his team. And um, again, the whole point of this wasn't just to fight with tech companies. That's important, doing that work, but also how do we use it to organize decision makers as well as educate folks in our community, right? So network building, I'm running out of time. So a big, 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 big piece of the work that we do is building a network, right? Building up leaders, finding opportunities for folks right here in this room to not just have amazing leadership roles at the conference, but throughout the year, right? And one of the things that I go around and do, as I mentioned, was speak a lot. And I'm so excited that, you know, this is, my, this is me speaking. This is actually a picture of me speaking in um, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, supporting work out there, efforts to end what's called the cradle look to prison algorithm. Is Marika here? Marika from St. Paul. Okay, so she, she can see me right here on the live stream. But find folks from St. Paul, ask them about what's going on. Uh, right now, um, the local government there, local municipalities are engaging in a joint powers agreement, a data sharing agreement to use uh, social services data, suspension data, um, to, call, to create risk ratios to determine services um, and, and resource allocation for students. But in the context of the school to prison pipeline, we know what that means, right? Like when we're using suspension data that's already biased, we know who's suspended in this country. You know, what is that gonna be do? That's gonna be weaponized against our young people. So amazing work happening in St. Paul. This is a, a slide that I put in the presentation. Um, amazing work happening in St. Paul um, to organize black communities, native communities, Latino communities around this because um, it, it's really gonna take a multiracial effort um, to stop what's happening. So this is an amazing, this is our, our, our participant um, at that training that they held. Also, this is a photo um, from the Google Systems Dynamic Workshop that I mentioned yesterday um, at the Google Social. So I said last year, last night that Donald Martin from Google approached me last year about having a systems dynamic workshop. At first I was like, what is systems dynamic? I don't really know. But once I actually read into it, I realized that the language around systems dynamic, which is what um, engineers, researchers use in order to get to the root of problems, were very similar to the language that we used that I got trained up in as a community organizer, as a youth organizer. We're talking about the same things, but we're using different words, right? So I said, when we're thinking about building a network of scientists and activists, when we're thinking about collaborations, right, one of the biggest challenges is just that, language. So how do we come up with a shared language for scientists and activists for when we're at the table thinking about community issues, when we're at the table thinking about solutions, how can we find common ground um, and, and, and be able to work together and not talk past each other, right? So this effort around systems dynamics um, is culminating in part at this conference. So if, if you're registered for the um, um, workshop, please make sure you attend because it's going to be incredible. But also, you know, we, we, we really hope to continue to do some more writing and train up even more organizers and educators in this tool. Um, as we expand the work of the network and, and as we really, really, really do a lot of work of seeding these collaborations between scientists and activists. This is Irene and Holiday. If you're at the workshop, I'm telling you, I think they have space for a few more people. I don't want to lie to you guys, but no, no. Okay, sorry. It's so, it will be recorded. It will be recorded and made available at some point. Right, okay, I have our, some facilitators in the front telling me, thank you. I'm so excited about this, right? Like I. This is beautiful. So a big, big, big part of our work is around language and, and, and developing shared language. And again, leadership development, right? Making sure that we're equipping people with not just the data, not just the 
jargon, but with the real, real, real tools to do the work that they're doing. As I say, put a battery in people's back, right? In order to go back where they're from and feel empowered and feel prepared and confident in order to lead this work. So finally, research. So this is something that we've been working on kind of behind the scenes. Um, when last year we had this idea that there's, 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 so, there's a lot of efforts around auditing algorithms. There's a lot of amazing work that's happening on the corporate tech company side to make sure that there's fairness and accountability in algorithms. But where is the effort in order to educate people, regular everyday people in algorithmic accountability, but even taking it a step back and say, folks don't, don't even have the time, know when they're even interacting with an algorithm, right? So this is a part of an effort that we've been doing with researchers at um, UC Berkeley. I got, we got some designers involved, and we actually want to invite folks right here into this process as well of developing a kind of nutrition label for algorithms, right? And it really in an effort to make sure that folks understand what they're dealing with, especially as algorithms become even more embedded in our society. This is an example of my favorite algorithm, actually least favorite, but I like talking about it because it affects so many people, FICO credit scores. You know, and um, we, we came up with a series of categories after a lot, a lot of different, a lot of research, a lot of looking into what's already existing and what's needed. Um, and a grading system in order, um, again, for folks to understand and, and to know. And I think, you know, even the, the nutrition label in itself was a whole political agenda embodied in, you know, graphic design and, and, and a labeling system. But, you know, that's something that folks recognize um, and is accessible, right? That's the most important thing for us. So we're actually inviting people to be a part of this process. I don't know if there's maybe a channel on Hoover app or wait for folks to sign up. I'll have one of our volunteers handle that. If you want to be involved in thinking through a nutrition label for algorithms with us, um, please let me know um, because we, we want to keep designing it. We, we, we want to keep iterating and testing it in order for us to actually roll it out, right? Um, because as I said, we're getting into a time where even more so um, folks in our community especially are kind of being left behind, right? Things are moving so fast, and we want to make sure that people, again, not only know that they're interacting with an algorithm, but understand how it's impacting their life and the decisions that are going to have a real, 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 real big influence in their material conditions. And in this case, FICO credit scores are, are even being used for, uh, for employment, for everything, right? So now. <laughs> Sorry to breeze through with our Data for Black Lives part, but there's going to be so many opportunities for us to talk more about our work. Um, I do want to make sure I have time to really uplift our panelists. As you can obviously tell, a huge, huge part of our work is making sure this conference happens every year, right? Because this conference is an opportunity for us to lift up, for us to bring to the stage and to the live stream people who are at the front lines of resisting algorithmic injustice in this country, people that we are going to look to in the future, right? And now, but especially in the future, as these problems and as these issues become even more widespread. Our first panelist, Rashida Richardson, she's Director of Policy Research at AI Now Institute, where she designs, implements, and coordinates AI Now's research strategy and initiatives on the topics of law, policy, and civil rights. Rashida joined AI Now after working at, as a legislative counsel at New York Civil, Civil Liberties Union, the New York State affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union. She led the organization's work on privacy, technology, surveillance, and education issues. Privacy, prior to NYCLU, she was a staff attorney at the Center for HIV Law and Policy where she worked on a, a wide range of HIV-related legal and policy issues nationally. Previously, she worked at Facebook Inc. Come on, girl. We got to have our folks in there, I'm telling you. <laughs> and HIV investor in San Francisco. She currently serves on the advisory board of the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project and the board of directors of the Community and College Fellowship. First panel. So folks are actually going to come up afterwards, but I'll go ahead and introduce everybody now. Tamika Lewis. She's um, 
a community-based organizer and researcher who is dedicated to advancing black, POC, and queer marginalized communities, ending all forms of capitalism, developing popular education facilitation guides, and building black-led networks and movements. Originally from NYC, Tamika now lives in North Carolina and is co-director of North Carolina Black Leadership Collective, works for Blueprint North Carolina and the Our Bodies, Data, Our Bodies Research Project. Teresa Hodge is, is committed to reducing the harm prison causes to individuals and their families. After completing a 70-month federal prison sentence, she co-founded Mission Launch with her daughter, Lauren Leonard. The organization focuses on financially stabilizing opportunities for individuals post-incarceration. Teresa was named an Echo and Green 2018 Fellow and a member of New Profits Unlocked Futures Accelerator to bring the R3 score to life. R3 score is a web and mobile app designed to improve the economic health of individuals with criminal records by producing an algorithm, making her own algorithm, for background screening that is fair, demonstrates the strength and capacity of individuals living with records, and expands access to jobs, entrepreneurship, and financial products. Last but certainly not least, Joy Bulawimni is a poet of code. He uses art and research to illuminate the social implications of artificial intelligence. She founded the algorithm that justice League to fight the coded gaze, harmful bias in AI. At the MIT Media Lab, she pioneered techniques that are now leading to increase transparency in the use of facial analysis technology globally. Her TED talk on algorithmic bias has been viewed over one million times. More than 230 articles in 37 countries have been written about her Gender Shades MIT project, which has uncovered the largest gender and racial disparities in commercial AI services. Great, so we're gonna have our folks come up, but right before, I wanna bring someone up to the stage, Raul Bargava, one of the things that we're also doing, um, as I mentioned with the Facebook letter, is the Facebook letter demands is a data code of ethics. And we want your input in what that means. So Raul, if you wanna talk about the installation. Sure, thank you. Uh, as yeah, she mentioned, my name is Rahul Vargav. I'm a research scientist here at the Center for Civic Media, uh, co-founder of the Data Culture Project and creator of the Just Data Cube outside. Uh, I'm so honored to be invited in to contribute to the event. And what we wanna do, uh, you're all here as we've been talking about to try to change the present and create that future. But how do we get there? We get there with commitments to ourselves and demands of those organizations around us that are creating the data society that we're living in, those data chauvinists we heard about last night. So this is kind of a room of rule breakers. So the rule we're gonna break today is uh, if you were like me when you were a kid or if you have kids now like me, you don't write on the walls, right? I'm inviting you to write on the walls. <laughs> so we got this cube outside. We want you to share those commitments to yourself that can get us to that future on the inside of the wall where it says we commit. And then on the outside of the wall, share your demands of the organizations, the companies, the governments, to try to create that future like your wonderful letter, open letter talked about. Share those on the outside. Grab a pen, write up your ideas. Hopefully you'll come get, share and get inspired by what others are doing. And we'll create something wonderful together. All of that will feed into these programs that Data for Black Lives is doing. So this will be a wonderful way for you to contribute and inform the processes that they're doing. Again, thank you very much. I'll see you outside at the Cube in between the sessions. Thank you, Raul. If you need to sort of take your mind off of it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And without further ado, I'll bring up our first speaker, Rashida Richardson. Hi. Um, so I'm just gonna give a little background on myself and on AI now, and then we can dig in deeper when we talk, go into discussion as a group. Um, AI Now is a research institute based at NYU, and we focus on the social implications of artificial intelligence. And we see artificial intelligence as a technology that can serve to reinforce and strengthen um, existing power structures and systems, or it can be used as an opportunity to dismantle and mitigate the systemic and structural oppression. And this is because both what is seen as a problem and what is chosen um, as the problems for AI to address are inherently political decisions. And that is like a piece that's often not appreciated to see how it can both be terrible and great. Um, 
And myself, um, my background is as a lawyer. Prior to AI Now, he actually gave the great background of like a lot of different areas I worked, but I've worked in a lot of um, civil rights issues and a fundamental interest in all of that work, and especially at AI Now, is understanding the structures, systems, and psychology of people who create and uphold systems of oppression that we're all subject to. And I give that background because it's important in understanding how I approach the work, but also how we as an organization think about these issues. And that's because, in especially the United States, we have a fairly regressive legal system that serves to ratify a lot of the social inequities that we see in the world. And it's also, and the law is also seen as a tool that can be used to mitigate or even address some of these issues. So understanding that tension and how it is both a flawed and useful is really important in trying to understand how do we deal with a lot of the challenges that have been discussed today and especially um, brought up in yesterday's keynote address. As the director of policy research, my role is both as a practitioner and a researcher, and I try to make that process iterative. So the research um, is varied, so I'll go through some of that. Um, some of it is domain specific, so it's looking at specific applications of algorithmic systems and AI, um, and that in can include a variety of tools that are used to accelerate mass incarceration or um, tools that are used to assign where a student may go to school, which we know, especially in the US, that can determine a lot about the opportunities that you're given and your life outcomes. And um, we do deep examinations into these applications to understand both the legal and social implications to inform broader discussion because at least like my experience in a lot of spaces where we're talking about AI either in the macro view or specific applications, it seems like you know, there's pros and cons, and we just want the pros to be slightly better than the cons. And, and, and I think a lot of us know that it's like, that's both a function of power and privilege in itself to determine, like, it's okay that some people are harmed. But so I think the research in itself is to help engage and inform that conversation of like, maybe some tools should not even be used. And maybe some problems that are seen by policymakers and society at large are not in fact a problem, but a symptom of something else. Um, so some of the research is to just dig in deeper so we as a community can be in, more informed about what we actually want to advocate for and have a unified message. That research also informs um, the work that we do around policy framework. So last year we released a lot of stuff, <laughs> um, but what a few of the reports are. One is um, algorithmic impact assessments, which is a framework for trying to understand how to create better transparency and accountability in understanding the use of these systems within government. And we've also created a number of tools for advocates and researchers so we are all um, have a general understanding of not only the technology, but the social implications, because I think that's the piece that is often lost in the conversation is it's very techno-focused, but it's the social application that we really need to understand. So if you're applying, if you're just putting technology on top of a broken system, what's gonna happen? It's gonna stay broken and just get worse. Um, and so all of that research is then we try to put it into practice by engaging policymakers, by telling them or inferring <laughs> what may be a useful way of trying to rein in or think about how the law can be used as a tool in addressing some of um, the more problematic use cases or how the law can be used to encourage better practices within industry in creating these tools. And then that work is also used to build community and build capacity among stakeholders because a common theme of this conference, which I really stand behind, is that this work, both the research and the advocacy, needs to be interdisciplinary and include everyone um, because there's not one perspective that really true, like I don't think there's any one perspective that outweighs another in these issues and there's definitely a bunch of interest at play so we all need to have opportunities to engage and inform how we can either make things a little bit worse or just dismantle everything and make it better. I'm going to hand over my time to someone else, and I look forward to the rest of our conversation. Thank you. Good morning. 
My name is Teresa Hodge, and seven years ago, I was, I was still under the supervision of um, the Bureau of Prisons. I knew I was going to do something around criminal justice, but I had no idea that I would be standing here today. When I first came home, I started a nonprofit, and I was just determined to ensure that prison would not ruin the lives of people for the rest of their lives. And while I was sitting in prison, I read an article. And the article I read, it talked about the pipeline to prison. And it talked about the number of children who had an incarcerated parent. What was the possibility of their lives? And as a mother, my heart was broken. It was broken by what I heard. And I went to prison at Alderson um, Federal Prison Camp. It's the largest and oldest prison um, in the United States for women. And the visiting room was not like the rest of the compound. The visiting room, they did a relatively good job of ensuring that mothers and grandmothers and aunts could interact with their children. And so my daughter was visiting me. Um, when I went to prison, I went at 44, so I went older. My daughter had graduated from college, so I was fortunate that I had invested enough in her. But on that day when she was visiting, there were lots of children running around. And I told her about the article that I read. And I said, the article said that seven out of 10 children who have an incarcerated parent are more likely to go to prison. And I said, count 10 children and tell me which three deserve not to go to prison. And it was with that that my daughter partnered with me in the work that we're doing today. We started off um, just ensuring that individuals, when they came home, could have agency over their lives. And so we chose the path of entrepreneurship for people who had the ability to create a job because someone wouldn't give them a job. The problem that we ran into was we could teach people entrepreneurship, but we couldn't force bankers to give them money. Banks are designed to avoid risk. And when an individual who has a criminal record shows up, they deem the person too risky for the opportunity to have access to capital. We started working with community development financial institutions and started being approached by them. And for folks who don't know, community development financial institutions, also known as CDFIs, it's where the larger banks throw their mandated dollars, Community Reinvestment Act dollars, CRA dollars, to these institutions and say, you give this money out at the very lowest end of the community level. But what we found were these CDFIs, they came to us and said, we don't know how to assess individuals who have arrest or conviction records. And so one CDFI approached and said, pick out 20 people who have an arrest or conviction record, and if you tell me to give them the money, we'll give it to them. So basically, he was asking me to become his underwriter and do all of his work. So then I, you know, I thought about it. I had 20 people who I could do this for, but then I thought, well, what if they don't pay? Do I have to do the collections? You know, like how does the dynamics of this relationship adjust if that happened? Three weeks later, somebody asked me the same thing, and then two weeks, someone else, and I thought, okay, wait a minute. There are some people, potentially, who want to give money to individuals who have arrest or conviction records, but they don't know how to assess them. So I have to disclose, I'm not a data scientist or a researcher, I don't know how to write code or any of that. But I am a business person, and I had the lived experience of incarceration. And I had come in contact with enough people that I felt like I could figure it out. So for three days, <laughs> So for the next three days, I sat down with a team of folks and I said, let's see if we can vet individuals who have arrest or conviction records to access opportunity. And what would that process look like? And so we just you know, first looked to the marketplace to see, does a tool already exist? And the answer was no. And then we just started pulling research and information. And then we just thought, what would be fair? What would make sense? How do we hold public safety? You know, because if our algorithm does not consider public safety, 
then the marketplace will kill it. So we went through a lot of different things. And at the end of that three-day process, the rubric that we created is R3 score. And so for us, R3 score is a fair way to assess an individual who has an arrest or conviction record so that they can access opportunity. It has wide case use. It could be used for jobs. It could be used um, for any individuals who are seeking higher education. It could be used um, for banking. We are going to do a demonstration of it with banking. This year we have um, some pilots. But we also have been contacted by Indeed, the jobs board, who heard, I think, after the Echoing Green Fellowship of what we were doing. And they said, we are interested. I was uh, given a presentation Wednesday. And Stanley Black & Decker is interested in using this. So the good news is there are people who understand that we cannot lock a third of our population out of opportunities for the rest of their lives. And so I am super excited about this opportunity. But I have an ask for this community. My ask is I am not a data scientist, a researcher, and I need your help to support this. By the year 2030, I want this tool to become the gold standard of how we assess individuals who have arrest or conviction records because it is designed to pipeline people to opportunity and not to lock them out. You know. So like Rashida, I'm going to yield the rest of my time for the greater conversation. But I am excited to be here with you this morning and to share and to receive. Thank you. Please welcome Tamika Lewis. Uh, peace. So we have learned a lot from Maxine Waters around reclaiming time, and I am here for it. Um, peace, y'all. Good morning. My name is Tamika Lewis. I am a community organizer and researcher who is from who is from New York, but I live in North Carolina. I work with the Our Data Bodies Project, our ODB, and it's supposed to be funny. Um, and for the last three years, we have been working very hard in Charlotte, North Carolina, Detroit, Michigan, and Los Angeles, California, specifically Skid Row, to really think about how is data collection impacting our folks? What are the stories that folks want to share with us that go with the numbers that we see on statistics and reports? Right? And what do they really want and call from us? Over the last three years, we've collected over 140 interviews with our um, community participatory research model. And so if you are a researcher, you know that is a lot of data to code, OK? <laughs> and as cultural workers and organizers, which all of our team are, it's a lot of stories to hold to. It's so hard. So I'm going to start this off by reading some of the quotes that we collected from our members. Each institution should deal only with the information it needs. Collection systems should not only capture data that is necessary, they should not in intimidate people, they should not validate their human rights. Everything you do in this country, good or bad, is used against you. It doesn't have an impact on your family. Of course it does. Well, that was a question. A very negative impact. Those who suffer are always the children. What are we creating? Panic, fear, sadness. I mean, the credit score part, I really don't think that represents who I am. Because first of all, I don't really even understand it. I understand that it needs to be a certain level, but that just doesn't, but that just doesn't get why or who I am. It's not necessary to me. I mean, I'd rather have no credit than bad credit. I'm just saying, what's the point? The worst thing I've ever heard was, you probably should give up on finding a job. He was like, I don't even know why you came in here today, because you know you got a background. You know it's recent. And you know most places aren't going to hire you. So you probably should just give up and stop trying. Go to school or something. So I leave with those stories, because it's like, most times we have white, his cis-het men standing, telling our stories. 
the first time I was invited into a techie research conference, I had to listen to a white man describe his research around courtship in the new 21st century with black youth in Harlem. I am from Harlem. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and to make matters worse, there were only three academic, black academic researchers in the room. And so when we started sh calling them out, the whole room shut down and wanted to leave. And so it was like, what is our duty as black researchers, academics, community organizers to be on the front lines telling and collecting our stories and figuring out how we use the data to do what we need to do? Um, algorithms is not new shit. It's just a new term for the same thing that has been happening. Redlining, school segregation, enslavement, evictions, insurance are all the ways that white, well, capitalism uses data to disenfranchise our folks. Algorithms is just a new catchy term that like, makes it so science and the language that people don't understand validate the experience or, of white people or people with wealth and devalue the people and the experiences of our communities. So this, this thing is like, we are the leaders we've been looking for. We are the leaders we've been looking for. Can you say that? We are the leaders that we've been looking for. We are the leaders that we've been looking for. Say it again. We are the leaders we've been looking for. Say it again. We are the leaders we've been looking for. Okay, and so with that, it's like, what are we going to do? This room is beautiful and unique. If you look around, turn around, see your neighbors, see each other in our fullest, in our Full as dignity, it's like, what are you willing to do to make sure our folks don't continue to experience the same amount of oppressions, right? <laughs> what are we doing to make sure that our folks have access to language, access to their experiences and ways to verbalize it, that we are taking heed from them, from us to be like, when we go to Capitol Hill, it's like, this was the folks on the front line one. Right? Is your organization prepared to put people who are most marginalized in the front to be like, and to check itself if it's disaligned, because that's the hardest thing. And so Charlene Carruthers has a book called Unapologetic, and she asks us to reimagine or reinvigorate the black imagination. So as data tech scientists and organizers, how can we build our own algorithms to predict white supremacist and police departments? How can we, as community organizers and data tech scientists, create algorithms that help to provide direct service needs to communities who need it, right? Like, what can we do? We, I am not interested in fighting white supremacy on the front line and the way that I have to stand and work with people to harm myself over and over again. But I am also willing to sit in a room with black, brown people and like recreate the shit that we need so we can help to transition the system that we need, right? We can smash capitalism, smash patriarchy, smash all of the shit while building up the tools and the necessary things that we need to see. Um, so with that, um, I'm really happy to announce that the Our Data Bodies Project actually developed a tool called the Digital Defense Playbook based on our stories for after the last three years. We listened to the stories of the community members. We went back and was like, okay, what do we really need to do? It's producing a report that says the, this is what folks, this is what's happening with folks. Is that important? And our community members like Tawana Perry, Maddie Alessaba were like, no. We need to be on the front lines educating people around what they need to know, what language they need to be using. What is data? Right? Why is it useful? How is it being used? And so we spent the last three years piloting, going to communities, getting a lot of feedback, going back, writing, going. It was just a long process. But now we're happy to say that we have this tool for folks. And it's just hot off the presses, like yesterday boxes are in my house. So we don't have a lot here, but I will get your contact information if you want it. We need community organizers and members to go start using this in their communities and teaching people around what's happening and giving us the shared language and the tools that we could start talking to be able to advocate for ourselves. Because if we don't, we're in the black. We're in the dark. We have been there for a very long time, but like BYP 100 says, we are our new ra radical movement. We are the new movement of the 21st century, and we will not be had. We will not be disenfranchised, because we black, and we beautiful, and we live. Um, so yes, thank y'all very much, and I will end on that.
please welcome Joy Bulamwini. I don't always get to carry my shield around, so I'm a, I'm a take it. So I'm Joy, I'm a poet of code on a mission to show compassion through computation. I'm the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, and today I'm going to share with you how the organization got started and what we've been doing. So how many have heard of the male gaze? The white gaze? The post-colonial gaze? Well, to that lexicon. <laughs> We add the coded gaze, and the coded gaze is a reflection of the priorities and prejudices of those who have the power to shape technology. And I first encountered the coded gaze when I was working on an art project. And as I was working on the art project, I found out how to wear a white mask to have my face detected right here in the media lab. I was like, dang, Fanon already said it, but it's, it's here, you know? And so after that experience, I had the opportunity to share it in a TED Talk that received a lot of attention. So I was like, someone might check my claims. So let me check myself. And I ran my TED profile image through AI systems from all of these companies. And what I found was some companies didn't detect my face at all, which could be good. Surveillance state, I'm evading it. All like, <laughs> Not the worst thing. But the ones that did detect my face were labeling me male, which I do not identify as. And this seemed annoying, but I got a little more concerned when I saw even the women of Wakanda were not being detected um, in some cases, or if they were being detected, again, being misgendered in some of these uh, areas. And then I decided to look beyond gender, right? I started looking at age. Turns out black don't crack. You see those red, <laughs> the red columns? The age, the ages, they just couldn't get the ages. In fact, for Angela Bassett, she's 59 in that photo. We got 18 to 24 from IBM. <laughs> the closest one was from Face++ Plus Plus at 45, right? So not even close. Then I encountered a report called The Perpetual Lineup from Georgetown Law. Is Laura Moy in the audience? Yes, this was amazing work. And what it showed was that one in two adults, over 130 million people, has their face in a face recognition network that can be searched unwarranted using algorithms that haven't even been checked to see if they do what they think they're doing in the first place, at least in the US. In the UK, they have been checking, and the numbers aren't good. You have false positive match rates of over 90% in the best case scenarios. That's more than 2,400 folks who've been falsely misidentified, and you even had cases where women, right, innocent women were falsely matched with men. So some of those examples that I showed are what you saw in the AI Ain't I Woman poem from last night. They have real world implications. And so because these systems are being deployed, this is why I focused my attention on facial analysis technology for my MIT master's thesis. And after doing that work, I published a paper with uh, Dr. Timnit Gebru. Is she here from Ethiopia in the... Okay, she'll, she'll be here tomorrow. You should uh, check her out. And so this paper received a lot of attention. It was announced in the New York Times, and then that led to subsequent uh, media coverage. Here we are posing for Bloomberg 50 and just owning the space, because why not <laughs> if you show up? So for this research, the first thing I had to look at is that for systems like facial analysis technology that are using machine learning, the machines are learning from data. And so essentially, data is destiny. And right now, we got a bunch of pale male data sets that are being used to power these systems. And on top of pale male data sets, we also have a lot of supremely white data. So if we're thinking about areas like precision health, giving the right medicine to the right person at the right time, and you look and you say it wasn't even until 1993 that women and people of color were mandated to be part of clinical trials, we really have to be thinking about who's included in the data, who's excluded, and what does that mean. So because the data sets were so pale and male, I had to create something that was a bit more inclusive. They thought 
told me it'd be difficult, it can't be done. We did it. We went to the UN Women's website and got a list of the top 10 countries by their representation of women in parliament. Guess who was number one in the world? Rwanda, yes, 60%. Then you had some progressive Nordic countries, and then you also had a few more African countries there. Here you'll see that we've labeled it in a gender binary, not because gender is so reduced, but because those are the labels that the companies themselves use when they are making these predictions. So with a more inclusive data set, we could finally ask, how accurate are these companies? Your IBMs, your Microsofts, and Face++, a billion dollar tech company in China that um, actually has one of the largest data sets of Chinese faces in the world and is used by the government. So let's look at the results. Overall, they might seem OK. IBM maybe gets a B in the 88. Microsoft leading the way, 94. And depending on your grading curve, uh, Face++ plus plus may be a, I don't know where they are. But what gets really interesting is when we start to break it down. So if we break it down by gender, you know the story. These systems work better on male faces than female faces. If we break it down by skin type, Overall, they work better on lighter faces than darker faces. And then drawing on some inspiration from Kimberly Crenshaw, I was like, OK, let's not do just single axis analysis. Let's look at the intersection. And when we look at the intersection, what we'll see, perfect performance for the pale males from Microsoft, 100%, right? <laughs> Now let's look at another column, you know, the red column, not quite at 100%. This is an aggregate. So the, the test I did was actually the simplest test I could do, which is to take profile images where people are looking directly at the camera. So you really couldn't get an easier test than this. And they still fail. So now, if we do it, if we disaggregate and we look at the most highly melanated women, like the women of Wakanda, or women like myself, you see they had error rates close to 47% in a binary classification task because they've reduced gender to binary, right? So you got a 50-50 shot of just getting it right. And I paid to do this, also I'm paying for these results. My question was, would this, would any of these products have shipped if the numbers were reversed and if they were for pale males? So I decided to ask the companies and I sent them uh, the results. The companies had varying responses. Face++ Plus Plus didn't get back to us, but they wrote in Chinese media that they had performed best on darker males, so they were <laughs> the better company. Microsoft got back. They have a new API out, but then I tested a photo of myself from Microsoft. You might have seen it yesterday. That profile shot of Dr. Gebru and myself right, for Bloomberg 50, where we're talking about this research and they're talking about all of those improvements they've made, still being labeled as men in that situation. Now, IBM, they were very responsive. They replied back the day we sent the results and in fact released a new version of the system when we reported the research. And so you can see that they've made some improvements. So for people who tell me, isn't the reason you weren't detected because, you know, you dark skin, contrast issues, all of that. I would say the laws of physics didn't change between December 22nd <laughs> when I sent them the results, right, <laughs> and February when they updated it. What changed is it became a priority. Now let's ask why it became a priority. Because even if we improve the accuracy of these systems, these systems can still be abused. So over the summer, the Intercept did a little investigative reporting. And what did they find? They found out that IBM had supplied the New York Police Department with video analytic systems that could search people by skin type. Right, so they got a little incentive to try to get those numbers up. And if, it, and if we don't have oversight about how these technologies are being used, regardless of accuracy, they will be weaponized against us. And so over the summer, I had an opportunity to write an op-ed for the New York Times on the dangers of facial analysis technology. Senator Kamala Harris, she read it, invited me to share some of the research. And then she and six other senators sent letters to the Federal Trade Commission, to the EEOC, and to the FBI, demanding that they look at 
at the risk of facial analysis technologies within the US. And now we are starting to move forward to look at what could legislation look like at the federal level and also at the state level. But we all know policy takes time, as does legislation. And so one thing that we've launched with the Algorithmic Justice League in partnership with the Center on Privacy and Technology from Georgetown Law is the Safe Face Pledge. And the idea behind the Safe Face Pledge is to, one, prevent the lethal use of facial analysis technology. Think drones, cameras, guns, facial recognition. Accuracy is not the question here, right? It's a question of norms. Do we even want this technology in the first place? If we're thinking about uh, government mass surveillance or the use of these technologies by law enforcement, this isn't something we necessarily want in our community. So this is why we've launched the Safe Face Pledge. I encourage you to check out the website if this is something you support individually or your organization can get behind, do let us know. So thank you very much. OK. Thank you. Great. Wow. Thank you all so much. So right now we're going to have a discussion. And because time's a little bit limited, I won't be asking any questions. Part of the reason <laughs> we organized this whole panel selfishly was to, I get to talk to you all, all the time, and I want y'all to be here. <laughs> but I want to give a, the audience a chance to ask questions. We're also taking questions on Twitter, so data for black lives. Um, we have our amazing volunteers, Sultan and Wood Jerry, roaming around with mics on both sides. Um, but I think we have a, a first question from Zoltan. Yeah, so I was saying, um, you guys are all amazing. I'm, I'm so inspired just by hearing that. And so I was wondering, with all those awesome people in the room and yourselves, how do we make sure that in the work that we're doing, we're spending as much, if not more, time creating the vision of what we want to see, as opposed to challenging the existing structures mm -hmm. and sort of giving our energy you know, to, to the negative and, and as opposed to like replacing it with what we, what we want? Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody want to take it first? We can go down. Um, so I think some of the, I think that's part of the struggle because it's kind of like we can say how bad these systems are, but then what? Um, and I think part of it is reorienting the question. So th I think when I was speaking, I think when I was speaking earlier, <laughs> I uh, was raising, I raised the point of like, there's both a difference in how, what we see as problems and then what we choose to address. And those are inherently political decisions. And I think that's the pushback that needs to be necessary. So if we know that a lot of what is seen as the problems of public safety in the criminal justice systems are actually symptoms of poverty and systemic racism, then like let's shift that focus. How can we use data to like show people with power that they've been making and invested choices in maintaining their power structures and then shift like shifting the conversation to trying to address actual problems mm -hmm. rather than these like fallacies that we continue uh, to base our policy choices on. I think I'd jump in and also say that we have to approach it um, kind of our resistance um, from different legs. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> and I think the work that we're doing, it's that. We're, we're trying to bring a new tool to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. We are also highlighting how the existing tools don't work. Mm -hmm. But our focus is, here's a business case for why this tool is important, because there are um, our jobs that are going un unfilled based upon the fact that so many folks who have records are not being considered. And the strongest case for us was when we went to the banks and say, this population is banking. They're not banking with you. Mm. You know, capitalism understands money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in that moment, they were willing to see this differently. So I think that it is resistance. We're organizing. We're doing some other things. But it has to take different forms. And I would just add that we need to start with visioning around what is the world that we want to see and create, mm -hmm. and then what are the material conditions that we need to make that possible. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that we asked our research participants is like, what do you want to see? Mm -hmm. If you could write laws or policies, what would you include? And so it's a visioning scape around like, what's possible? Mm -hmm. um, we may not be able to reach it all right now, but we could start with the medium like oh, hanging fruit, not the lowest, because you know. <laughs> <laughs> we already got that. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. You 
more questions? Thank you. Don't be shy. Hello. Um, I am not a Hispanic person. I am not a black person. But uh, in the past two jobs I had in the tech industry, one at Apple with Siri doing speech recognition, one at a com company called Spoken Communication doing speech recognition, um, I became an unpopular employee for speaking out. And I do not work at these companies anymore. Um, with Apple, uh, they were doing uh, English dialect speech recognition, and they were going for Australian English, Singaporean English, Indian English. And I said, what about African American English? Mm. And the response given to me by my boss was, well, Apple products are for the premium market. Ooh. And this was in 2015, Ooh, and it was one year that. after <laughs> Dr. Dre sold Beats by Dr. Dre to <laughs> Apple for a billion dollars. <laughs> and who is buying, who is the target market for Beats by Dr. Dre products for $400 headphones? Mm -hmm. Who is buying those headphones? Mm. That's a premium product. Mm -hmm. Who is buying those products? We know. Wow. And so I do not work there anymore. The second company, <laughs> that was like the I'm getting you. my question. <laughs> uh, my, I'm getting my question. The second company I worked for was for making a call center, um, call center speech recognition so that AIs can help in the call center's experience. And they were doing Spanish. And uh, I was like, oh, that's great. We should get some Spanish speakers on the project. And they'd outsourced the project to this company in Poland. And I said, are there any Spanish speakers on that team? And they said, no, we just, we have the data. And I said, how will you know the data is correct? None of y'all speak Spanish. <laughs> and I was fired from that company a, <laughs> a month later. But um, so my question is: uh, Yes, we want to speak out, but we also have to worry about our financial stability. Um, I, I'm in grad school now. I do not earn money anymore. I'm grad school. Um, so that, what what can we do as people who work for companies who will ready to fire us when we speak out like this? Golly. And one thing I will say before I'll, we'll, we get to panelists, you know, that's part of the reason why we started Data for Black Lives. I know that I can get on stage and say things that folks who work within companies just can't say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we want people to know when they're in their companies, when they're working, that they're not alone. They have a whole movement behind them. Yeah. yeah. Right? We want Data for Black Lives to be a political home for people, right? <laughs> for our folks. Everybody, allies who are w working within these companies. So I'll just say that. So you got a home here. <laughs> Absolutely. And having that ecosystem of support where maybe you can't say something right now, but you got a friend at the Algorithmic Justice League who can call them out. We might do it in a poem. We might do it in a different Come way. On. But that's been helpful. One of the things we do with the Algorithmic Justice League is we um, have a, a spot where people can, can submit bias in the wild reports right so one of the one of the reports we got was somebody's like i got a friend who works at a company <laughs> right you know like however you got to share it you know and uh what they were saying is with their facial recognition systems that the friend could only use certain conference rooms because most of the systems weren't calibrated to work um for her it's a very large tech company wow. And so that limited her workplace productivity. And that story led to this phrase I term the exclusion overhead, where you're thinking, how much does somebody else have to change themselves in order to fit your system? Do I have to speak Australian English, right, to get your system um, to work? in the first place. But knowing that we have an ecosystem, it's, it's been helpful. I can reach out to AI now when certain things happen to get right. um, insights, talk to ACLU, like having reach out to data for black lives as well. So trying to think through who you can go to, but also sometimes, and you have to decide if this is OK for you and if you're in a position where you want to make that stand internally. I had to do that when I was thinking about the gender shades research, because I am a graduate student. And these are the companies that fund most of the research within AI. There's risk involved in doing it. So, so, but sometimes you have to say, is this a risk I want to take on and bite the bullet there? So it depends. Mm -hmm. 
I think we need to have a mandate for large corporations, companies, funders, donors, rich people, people with a lot of capital, um, to put an intentional investment into starting black tech startups. So that way we don't have to have these conversations. Um, black Twitter went off a couple of weeks ago with black tech Twitter. Somebody was like, what does black tech look like? And so now there's like a network of a thousand plus black people, black techies who have the capabilities, the knowledge and the skills. And so it's like, where can we go to build together, to build the institutions that we need to see so that we don't have to have those hard conversations and feel isolated. We could just be like, Oh, we need to check for some like Dominican Spanish too. You okay. know what I mean? Everybody's yeah. like, we on it. Um, and so I just think that like we need to reimagine what do we need and then demand it. That's right. That's right. So I guess one of my questions is, and I mean, I'm getting to understand tech because I don't know how to code them. <laughs> I share with Teresa because a couple of my cohort members, one is Marcus Bullock who did Flick Shop, and Teresa who's doing um, R3 Score and. I know uh, a little bit about tech, but one of my questions is, it's more so a concern because I grew up in the 80s and I grew up a stone's throw away from Brown University and in my neighborhood, everybody was selling crack and most of the customers, customers to be honest with you, were from Johnson & Wales, Brown University, <laughs> and RISD, and none of them went to prison, but everybody from my went neighborhood to Brown, went to prison. So that means that my neighborhood was more so under surveillance than the neighborhood where mm -hmm. Brown was, and I'm concerned because when you're speaking about, especially with this facial recognition, mm -hmm. how do we, because it, it seems to me that they will use this more so in urban neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. How do we protect ourselves or think for, have foresight to protect ourselves because this seems to me just like they're putting everybody on ankle bracelets now, mm -hmm. that they will be, our neighborhoods will more so be under surveillance than other neighborhoods and it will be used as a tool to basically incarcerate us. Right. Absolutely. I mean, one thing that we really should be pushing for is legislation to stop this. And so there have been multiple calls for moratoriums. And uh, I think going at the state level is going to be one of the strategies that will be used. So as that's coming out, actually uh, supporting it and having the community support it and say, we don't want this technology. Because right now, what the tech companies are doing is they're hiring the lobbyists and they're trying to create a story that people want this tech. We did a poll and what they said is, if the technology will keep our community safer, we want it. Right? Who are they polling? How, how are they getting right. that? So it's really important that we actually have these counter narratives and counter stories that are uh, moving forward and also pushing for that uh, legislation as well. In our, in our workbook, we have a activity, a community-based activity called Look Up, which came from, um, I was doing some surveilling of the surveillance technology in one of the communities that I live in. Um, and a young man was doing some questionable, you know, whatever. And I was like, hey, yo, there's a camera right there. And he, he had, he, that was his spot, you know? And he had never considered to look up. Oh. And then the next day we met up again and he brought like four friends and was like, yo, we need to be looking up, right? Like, what is it, <laughs> really, that, like, what does it mean to be right next door in that corner so you could survive? Um, and so it's like, how do we enable community members to also start deploying survival skills right now while we wait for the things to move? I, I also wanna add just cause like, I had to do a lot of work around surveillance technology, so it's like you also have to see this as cumulative in that like you don't just throw facial recognition in. It's a bunch of other stuff that we're not paying attention to. So I think also keeping a high level of skepticism about government, because a lot of the times I'm seeing um, when government does engage the community, because the truth is a lot of this is done under smoke and mirrors, so you're not seeing it. It's not going through public processes. A lot of these technologies are not being procured through normal procurement processes. They're getting, like, if, there is an array of ways that, like, we are not getting access to information about this stuff. But then sometimes when um, governments do engage communities, it's seen as investment, and then it's like seen as shiny. So it's like, look, we're putting new arts technology in your neighborhood, but we're not going to mention that it also has sensors and cameras and all yeah, these other things. Nice and so yeah. like, if you're in a community where you're like, yeah, we don't actually, like they haven't built out 
uh, fiber optic cables for good internet access here, but they're going to put like a link cube here so I can access the internet. You're, you see that as like a good investment, but then you also need to think like what data is being collected, what mm -hmm. else is being done with this tool, because if the government doesn't want to invest in our schools and all other forms of like uh, social networks that are necessary for com underinvested under communities, then why all of a sudden is this, this technology seen as a quick, quick tool? Yeah. So um, I know that it, it, in general, it's like, that's not maybe the best advice to be like, be skeptical of everything, but really. <laughs> yeah, so that's really good advice. And one, one more thing talking about corporate surveillance, right? Let's think about Facebook, two billion face IDs, right? So like you have your fingerprints, Facebook stores your face print. Mm -hmm. So right now, Facebook has one of the largest stores of uh, your biometric data, mm -hmm. but it's not just your biometric data. They have your social graph of your people you're connected with. Mm -hmm. they, have the, they have a ton of data. And now what are they exploring? How might we link our Facebook data to a camera in a store, mm -hmm. yep. right? So we have to be thinking about how these systems are being linked as well. If we're talking about things like black Twitter, there's a research paper that came out that was showing bias in what do they put it, African-American vernacular to see yep. sentiment analysis. Are these people talking about negative or positive things? And it turned out that these systems couldn't even recognize black talk as English, it was being labeled as Turkish. Mm -hmm. Now think about things like extreme vetting, where you're saying <laughs> to determine if you get into a country or whatever else it might mm -hmm. be, we're going to use what you've put on social media. And it's not even understood mm -hmm. to be um, a language. So there's a lot we need to be thinking about on the corporate surveillance side as well, because it goes back to the government at the end of the day. Oh, and can I add one more? Yeah, sure. of course. Just to add one more player to government and corporations, it's also like think about your neighbor because a lot of these systems mm -hmm. can be used or abused to reinforce how people with power see how a public space should exist. Should exist. So it's not simply just government and corporate actors, but also the way our societal biases just play into um, and, and so like a good example is all like the backyard be Becky's, the corner store Caroline had like named the list oh, of white Betty. women calling police on black people, but they're just using existing systems yeah. to oppress and to reinforce the power structure. So it's, it's also like think about the players and who's gain winning from these systems. And an example of that, Amazon filed a patent where you have a doorbell with a camera and that has face recognition and the owner of the doorbell can program suspicious looking people into it where if that person or people who look like that person or misidentification happens the doorbell will call the police this is a patent out on the books right now we have time for one more question uh, i think i have the mic oh <laughs> yo 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 you have the floor too i know i have the mic <laughs> You have the floor too. Lat Latif Ali, um, 313 Productions and other things. I'm going to wear the 313 Productions hat right now. Um, I wanted to ask if there's a deliberate strategy when I listened to the young man talk about um, economic uh, vol being volatile because he's asking the right questions. Is there a strategic uh, plan put in place for us to create the kinds of businesses that we need to support? all of these people that we're now like rattling with all this new information that they're under some kind of weapons threat that now need to come out in the world and get gainful employment so that we can be part of some of the most burgeoning industries that are happening. Is there a plan for that emerging is, is my question. And I also want to thank you guys because I've been getting all these calls for Laquisha lately and now I understand why. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to wing it. Um, I think there is some ongoing work. Like, there's a lot of activism um, in tech companies by the workers right now. Um, one specific example was the Google walkout in December, November. My sense of time is off. Um, but there, like, one of the demands was about forced arbitration agreements, which is just another tool used in employers' benefits. 
And um, one interesting part of like that organizing effort is you have like Google, Facebook, and all of the companies come out after Google saying, OK, we're going to get rid of forced arbitration for sexual harassment. But if you actually look at the demands, it was like broader um, exclusion of forced arbitration, so also for discrimination. And I think ask, trying to think about, and this is why in my opening remarks I made the point of like the law can both be a detriment and a tool. It's also trying to like reinforce ask that you're making an organizing effort to try to dismantle tools that are used against employees. So, and I bring up that example because in some of these scenarios where you are standing up and raising issues because of bias, like that could be a discrimination claim that often never makes it anywhere, or like the HR will make a note of it. And if anything, it goes nowhere. But a lot of the times when they are actionable, then you're forced into a forced arbitration, which one, doesn't become public, so we don't even find out about this stuff. Um, but then two, it benefits the employer. So it creates the, it reinforces the power imbalance within these companies. So I think it's also just building on momentum of efforts that are happening right now and making sure that when there are organizing efforts, especially in these elite spaces, workers are being called out on their privilege and not in understanding that like you need to look at these problems through an intersectional lens. Yeah. It's not like if, if you're going to raise sexual assault issues, you have to understand it's going to affect white women and black women very differently. And like how do we think about solutions that are going to be inclusive of the fact that based on who you are, these problems are going to be worse or not as bad? I think I would just add to that that what I heard was um, a cry for entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and I love um, the theme. We are the leaders we have been looking for. Yeah. And what entrepreneurship does and what the entrepreneur does is they see the void and they step in and they feel it. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, is what I'm hearing, that there needs to be more people who are in this room who raise up and create solutions, mm -hmm. create the companies, so that when, you know, their, your economics are being challenged because of what you have to say, that there's a place for you to go. Yeah. And so if it does not exist, it should exist because you raised the question. And I think about what if we mandated when we're going against big banks and corporations that they use the R3 algorithm and partner with a reentry yes. program and a yes. community to make sure yes. that we are developing cooperatives and community-based businesses so that we don't have to go outside of our communities for work, that we like, we are supporting this work, right. we're supporting our communities right. and the organizations who are focused on making sure our folks have the right to self-determine, so, yeah. Ooh. We might have time for one more question. Do we have time for one more question, Phyllis? Okay. So who has the mic? Valencia? Yeah. I have the mic. Yes. Um, so I'm a Soros Justice Fellow, and I've been working on gun violence in South Florida for the last two years. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they said, because I'm creating a cross-sector collaboration, and the first thing was like, technology and data, technology and data. And the facial recognition came up. And until today, actually this morning, I didn't realize why I was against the record, facial recognition because I knew it would criminalize our communities further. Um, but my, my thing is, we're talking about accountability here. And my question for our black techies and our black data researchers, um, the fact that sometimes they fall victim to the money into capitalism, and they sell this technology and data to these companies that further criminalize us, and that was the issue that I was bumping into. So one, as we build our new narrative and we collect our own data, how are we holding ourselves accountable mm -hmm. to make yes. sure we don't criminalize ourselves? Yes. yes. And secondly, for our activists like me, um, all of this wonderful data that you all are sharing are we creating a space for us to be able to access this information? So like right now, I just text the chief of police, like, this is why we don't need the technology because I just learned in a conference the whole thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> Miami. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's, if I had this information a year and a half ago when I started my research, I think I would have been way further along. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna um, ask, 
for this whole room, for all of you all who work in this space, like as you continue to gather all this information, and maybe you do have it available, but if we can, if I can leave here at least with some of the places where I can find it so I can help further to assist my community, that would be great. All right. We'll also, I'll take your question too, and then you can answer both. Thank you, Valencia. Uh, good morning. I wish I could start my morning like this every day. Um, <laughs> um, my question is, do you have the Alexa, what do you think about the Alexa items, and do you have one? Because I, I'm clear on why I don't trust them, but uh, especially after today, but I know a lot of folks, we're in a generation of quick, easy, mm -hmm. this is cool, I like this, but we're not connecting it to what this whole panel just talked about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for for uh, Alexa, all of these uh, voice assistants, right? Essentially surveillance in our pockets because if you have to use a trigger word to start one of these systems, something's listening mm -hmm. for that trigger word in the first place, right? So sometimes you can be in a room and say Siri or other things and other people's phone will come on mm -hmm. online. So I think because of the convenience and the way these systems are marketed, mm -hmm. as you're trying to play your favorite song, what else is being listened to um, in the background. So definitely raising more awareness about what looks like convenience that in the end become shackles mm -hmm. is uh, very necessary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you listen, I tried not to create paranoia where I live. <laughs> and I also tried to buy the fire stick before Alexa was m mandatory. And when I got it with Alexa, because my daughter requested it, um, they told me that they no longer created the older versions. And so what I, the first thing I did was actually go into the settings, because you can pull up what, it, what it's tracking in the mm -hmm. conversations. And it had been listening since the, whoever put the microphone chip in it, the, the device started listening. And so I think about like the Patriot and how mass surveillance is like used. It, the way that they push it out, it's like, this is a convenience for you. Now you can tell me to order your paper towels, right? And so like, what is our option of like, we need to mandatorily opt in instead of mandatorily opting yes. out. Yes. Um, yes. Two, it's like, as a community, as a, as a country, are we saying that our convenience is more important than our security mm. and that surveillance is not safety. Mm -hmm. um, mm. New York over New Year's Eve just rolled out the biggest drone program. Yeah. And they put it on the news. They was like, oh yeah, we got the we launching the biggest drone program to keep folks safe for New Year's Eve. We have people who are like embedded in organizations and hotels, you know what I mean? And this is so great. And it's like, no, y'all are just preparing the mass meet like mass folks for fascism and what it would look like if it blew down. Um, and so just thinking about like what are we actually opting into and what do we need to be like, no, we need to opt into this and you can't make us opt out if we don't want to. Or maybe vice versa, but you know. I'll be quick. Two oh, points. One, um, to connect this to the keynote from last night, I also think it's a lot being done in Hollywood to normalize this stuff. Mm -hmm. If there was like one time I was in a hotel room and in the bathroom and had the TV on and I think like Quantico or one of those like police shows was on and they were like, we're gonna use facial recognition and biometric scanning, something, and it was just like they listed off words but in a way that I'm like, that's saying a lot of words that mean nothing, but, mm. but also it's like that's normalizing these words and these tools. So you're like, oh, it's normal for police to use facial recognition. It's normal for me to have this assistant because these are like, this is where we are in society. So it's also like, think about how you're being sold to normalize yeah. these tools. And then second, um, just to expand how we're thinking about convenience, it's not only that like, our data and privacy is at risk when we choose to use more convenient tools, but also like how that contributes to systems of oppression. So one thing to think about with Amazon, besides the fact that they're trying to have Alexa take all our data, is like they're also one of the worst employers mm -hmm. at all levels of the company. Mm -hmm. So and and not to like even try to make myself like I don't try. I, my rule is I try not to use Amazon unless it's absolutely necessary mm -hmm. to get something from them or like online because I think about like do I really want to be contributing to a company that I know underpays and pretty much is just trying to. Do 
do indentured yeah. servitude mm -hmm. um, in 2019. Yes. So it's like yeah. not only think about like how these technologies are affecting you, your privacy in our communities, but also how that convenience is related to the, like the larger systems that are shackling us. It's not simply just data, but it's feeding back into employment pro um, procedures and processes and just the wealth gap in our country. So it's like, it's all connected. We just need to be very critical about how we may be complicit in it by choice. And, and just to be clear, we don't always have choices. So, mm -hmm. um, but when you do have a choice, just think like, is this something I want to integrate into my life? <laughs> And we never got to the person's oh, question yeah. in the back around. Mm -hmm. I would like to see a resource lab or a centralized place where we all data tech scientists and folks can dump our research, dump findings, dump news clippings, or like, but there has to be an infrastructure that supports that. Those are people behind like mm -hmm. systems that need to be like, this is how we organize it. And so maybe we can create a little thing on the WOVA app to be like, we were Great. interested in doing this or just hear some resources just from this space. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> That's all the time we have for questions. But the great thing is, you have the whole day to find these amazing panelists and talk to them. Thank you all so much for being a part of this conference, for waking up and being here on time. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.